Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Fellowship. We're so glad you're here. I'm always glad to be here. Um, if you are new or visiting with us, we would love for you to just fill out a card on that back table, uh, um, connection card, and put it in the box. We just want to thank you um, for coming and send you an email. And I always forget to introduce myself. So I'm Jennifer Mahan, and my husband is Gary, and we serve as greeters here. You may have seen us sometime when you walked in. Um, a couple little things to remember, just no food or drink in here. We just don't want to stay in the carpet, so we just want to have water. Um, the speed bumps outside are for slowing down. I only say that because I would love to speed over those. But there's children playing, and there could be, and it's warm, and so just be really cautious when you're outside. Bathrooms, there are some here, but we're not going to use those. I think it's obvious why. We're going to use the ones out in the hall to the left if you have to go to the bathroom. Um, a good time to silence your cell phones and stand with me. I will read our call to worship. And I was going to say, too, a reminder to, I was thinking of the people in Florida and the building, and just to remember to pray for those people and how sad and what a week they've had, right? Psalm 66, 1 through 4 says this, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Let's pray. Lord, help us this morning to remove the distractions from our minds so we can worship you. We can sing and we can only worship you, Lord. We are here to remember what you have done for us. Your word says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is an amazing truth. And we want to remember that today, Lord. I do think of the people in Florida and the families and the lives that have been affected, Lord. I just pray for them. Give them peace and comfort. We love you, Lord, and we desire to obey you. Amen. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh praise Him, Alleluia, Thou burning sun with golden beam, Thou silver moon with softer gleam.
This morning is from Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. It's Israel's joy and restoration. Verse 14 says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you, He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. And on that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. For the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And he will exalt over you with loud singing.
You can be seated and join me in a prayer of confession. God in heaven, we confess our sins to you not because we doubt that you will forgive us. We don't confess because we have outstanding, unforgiven sins. But we know that you forgive us of all sins, past, present, and future. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, through his death on the cross, we know that in him we have peace with you and the assurance of pardon. So we confess our sins, Lord, to to renew our faith and our dependency on you, to draw near to you in humility as we ask for restoration and strength and power to walk in your ways. Lord, we confess our sins to learn and practice repentance. And so we're asking you to help us confess our sins, Lord. Show us where we are wayward, where we are giving in to temptation or believing the lies of the devil, where we are making much of ourselves. God, help us to see that exalting ourselves or beating ourselves up, in both cases, Lord, we're we're overly focused on who we are instead of you. So, Lord, in our confession of our sins, we pray that you would help us to maintain a confession of Christ that is bigger and louder. In his name we pray, amen. In Colossians chapter one, beginning in verse 15, the apostle Paul said this, speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross." At the core of our faith, at the core of our theology, at the core of who we are as Christians is the death of Jesus Christ. Christ's sacrifice is our salvation. His offering up of himself on the cross is what establishes peace. It didn't make peace possible. It made peace between a holy God and sinful men and women. And that peace is available to all who believe. It's made for them. Wrath of God satisfied. The tyranny of the devil overthrown. We have peace. This is what we see in the Lord's Supper. Not just that Jesus died, but that in his death he establishes peace. He conquers sin, death, hell, Satan. Jesus gave us this tradition, this sacrament, so that we would not forget but would always remember and draw near to the one who died but lives. He took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples at the end of the Passover meal and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Indicating like my death that I'm about to experience is not just a death. It is substitutionary in nature. I am dying not just for a purpose, but for a people. And he took the wine, he poured it into cups, and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And then he called us to do this regularly and frequently until he returns. We do it, and we do it together, not just to remember, but to receive grace. As we do this in faith, God is at work in us, changing us. We are having a special kind of fellowship with Jesus, not because he's in the cracker, but because he is here with us spiritually. 
That means that this is for those of you who confess Christ as Lord. This is for us who believe. And maybe your faith is small right now. Maybe your faith is weak. Maybe you're really, really struggling. And I get it. We struggle sometimes. But it's for you. Christ is here calling you to come, confessing your sin and your need and your only hope that God's love has been demonstrated towards you in Jesus dying for you. So if you believe, then we want to encourage you to come. If you do not believe, then we want to caution you. You should not come. You're not ready for this. But you might, you might be ready to receive Christ today. So we want, here's what we want you to do. If you're not yet a believer, you should use this time in the service to actually seek God. He's here. Seek the Lord. Ask God to help you to see your need for Jesus. Ask God to help you to see the spiritual danger that you are in, that we're all in apart from Christ. Ask God to open your eyes. I'll tell you, if you talk to any believer here, most of them can tell you, no, I, I remember what it was like to be spiritually blind, and now I know what it's like to see. Ask God to go to work to do what only he can do, to change your heart. Now, for those of you that are going to come forward, we ask that you would come all the way up to the front and then go over to the tiled area. Over there, we have two tables. One has juice and bread, and the other has wine and bread. And so watch the placards. Take what your conscience allows. Just know what you're getting. And also, we have some of those sealed up, prepackaged, hermetically sealed, coronavirus safe things that are left over, and those are there. You can take them. And uh, but, So we still have those left over, but then we've gone back to our traditional matzah and wine or matzah and juice. So again, uh, take what you like, but take them with you away from the table to one of the three or four stations that we have. There is the place where you can praise the Lord, thank Christ for his death, praise the Father for his love, thank the Spirit for opening up your eyes. If you've got your kids with you, make sure you're doing this together. That's great. Uh, but take the time to eat and drink and remember and be assured that Jesus died for you, for your sins, and for your salvation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful for your love. We are overwhelmed by it. It doesn't make sense, Lord. We are unworthy, and yet you love us with this relentless, eternal love. We know that you love us because Christ died for us, and in response, we love you. God, we pray that as we do this and as we do it in faith, that you would strengthen our faith and our dependency on you, that you would revive us wherever needed, that you would unite us together uh, in our love for you and each other, but all because Jesus is our Savior. In his name we pray, amen.
This time all children, ages five years old to fifth grade, you're invited to Journey Kids, so if you meet your teachers and leaders in the back, they'll be there waiting for you. For the rest of us, as we continue to worship, Isaiah 53 says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, that he was put that he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offering, and he shall prolong his days. For the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Let's stand and let's worship our Savior. Jesus, my all, victorious love, who shed in my heart abroad. Then shall my feet no longer roam rooted and fixed in God and oh that in me the sacred fire might now begin to glow burn up the dross of my base desire and make the mountains flow make them flow though victorious love you bore the wrath reserved for us jesus Victorious love, you conquered death, you saved our soul. Though that it now from heaven might fall, and all my sins consume. Come, Holy Ghost, for Thee I call, Spirit of burning, come, won't you come? Though victorious love, you bore the wrath, reserved for us. Victorious love, you conquered death, you saved our soul. Refining fire, go through my heart, illuminate my soul. Scatter my life through every part. Come and make me whole. Refining fire, go through my heart, illuminate my soul. Scatter my life through every part. Come and make me whole. Though victorious love you bore the wrath reserved for us jesus victorious love you conquered death you saved our souls oh victorious love you bore the wrath reserved for us Jesus, victorious love, you conquered death, you saved our soul.
We're going to read together from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, Join me in reading the bold underlined portions. Verses 55 through 57 says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting sting of of death death is sin, and and the the power power of sin is the law. But But thanks be to God, who who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness Your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope.
my living hope. You may be seated. This is the time in our service where we worship the Lord through our giving of our tithes and offerings. Um, if you're new to Redeemer Fellowship, please don't feel obligated. This is for people that call Redeemer Fellowship their home. You can still give online, and there's a white box in the back that you can put your tithes and offerings in as well. Um, I read in Malachi 4, 7 through 12 this week about the Israelites who stopped giving, and this is what the Lord had to say about that. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes, and you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Lord, I have to admit, I have never thought of not giving to you as robbing from you, and yet that's what you say. I pray that we would be a generous people, that we would give out of abundance or out of little of what we have, Lord, that we would give cheerfully, um, not begrudgingly. We want to support Redeemer Fellowship and the church plants. We are a blessed church that um, your word is preached clearly, and we want to support that. We want more followers of you. We want more people to hear the great news of the gospel, and that's part of why we give. Lord, we are blessed to be here all together in this house. I pray for Joe as he speaks the words that he has studied, that you would show him what to speak. I pray that we would be good listeners, that we wouldn't just listen on Sunday, but that we would put it into practice in our daily lives, that we would live a, white, a life worthy of the calling you have called us to, Lord. We love you, and we desire to obey you. Amen. Joe, I just want you to know I have, I have my bifocals on now. Are you happy? Okay. Um, a few announcements. Uh, closed closet giveaway is uh, Monday, July 5th. We really need some people to help if you can come at 6. It starts at 6.15 to 7.30, but there's a lot of heavy bags to lift, and Deb can't do all of that. So if you can come and help with that, that would be great. Um, Parent-child dedication. You need to take the class before you can have the child dedication, obviously. Um, that class is Saturday, July 10th, 9 to 11, and the actual dedication will be Sunday, July 25th. Um, and that is, mm, that's at Redeemer? I'm trying to, now I'm looking at it. So sorry. Yes. Okay. I don't see that there. So it's at Redeemer. Sorry. Uh, membership orientation class is at Redeemer. Sunday, July 11th from 3 to 7. If you just want to know about our church and what we believe, it's a good thing for you to go to. Yeah, I don't like the bifocals. You can lose the bifocals. I must have said something about your glasses. You kept taking them on and off one Sunday because you, you didn't have bifocals. Now you got bifocals? You, nah, I don't like them. Nah, you can get rid of them. <laughs> Jennifer Mon is a good friend, so that's how, we, that's how we show respect to each other through mutual disrespect. <laughs> Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 17, which is the second half, really, of one particular vision. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 17. Now a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now 
the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown out, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore, Rejoice, O heavens, and all you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman who was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth and the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. This is God's word. Let's pray and ask for his help. Father in heaven, would you help us to understand? Would you equip us and give us wisdom so that as we read this and hear this, that Lord, we would know how to respond in our lives specifically. We pray that you would teach us and that you would change us, that you would strengthen our faith and prepare us for spiritual war. In Jesus' name, amen. If you know me well or if you've been around enough, you probably know, you might know, it's probably a better way to say it, you might know that I believed in the devil long before I believed in God. I definitely believed in the devil long before I believed in Jesus. And it's not because I was raised by Satanists. Most of you all, not, some, a lot of you all knew my mom. All right, she's passed away. My dad, you guys, a lot of you know him. And they are now followers of Jesus, but my sister's right here. We grew up in a home where God was not a part of the family. Uh, God was never mentioned. He was never the source of a solution. Uh, he was never the one to whom we would appeal for answers or to help. God did not exist in my home growing up. Neither did the devil, not explicitly anyways. But I found my way to the devil because I was asking a whole lot of questions. I was asking questions about why, as a kid, why are we here? Why does life, why is life so hard? Why am I so miserable? Why is it that I am a white, middle-class kid in Geneva, Illinois, but I'm miserable and want to kill myself. What is wrong with me? Asking all kinds of questions, and nobody had any answers for me. There was no Christian telling me the truth of a holy God who still loves sinful people, who put into place a plan of redemption to redeem me from my despair. There was no one around me to tell me that God loved me and sent his son to die as a substitute for sinners. There was no one telling me the gospel, the mystery of the gospel, the truth of God's word. There was nobody. But what I did find my way to were books on the occult and witchcraft and then Satanism. And so, yes, it's as cliche as you can imagine an 80s kid getting into Satanism. It's as cliche as, as, as you can imagine. I, I admit it, I agree, it's embarrassing. And boy, did I find that the devil gave me exactly what I wanted. He had answers that were very satisfying to me and to my flesh and to my ignorance. Very satisfying to me. Gave me the answers that I wanted. Gave me a lot that I wanted, actually. And you might think, like, okay, well, so a person who, you know, who kind of goes down that path, they probably have a lot of interactions with the devil and really got really wrapped up and you had, they, I mean... They are probably really close, and the devil probably had a whole lot more going on in their life than maybe someone else's life, but you would be wrong. You see, the, only the dumbest of the dumb follow the devil when he reveals himself to be the devil, right? Satan shows up, and he's like, hey, man, it's me, Satan. Uh, you want to kick it? You want to hang? And you're like, yeah, man, let's do that. You're a dummy. Most people, though, are won over by the devil, not when he presents himself as the evil one, as the accuser and the liar, 
But as the angel of light, the enlightened one, the beautiful one, the one who is sympathetic and understanding and supportive to you in all of your needs, the reality is the devil is as active in a person's life who is morally upright and an example in their society. He's as active there as he is in another person life who is characterized by sexual immorality and all of the taboo sins that aren't fit to be mentioned in polite company. And this is part of what I want us to see, what the devil is doing, what the devil is doing in our world and therefore in our lives. Too many of us think the devil has nothing going on in my life because I follow Jesus, so the devil's out. You are wrong. The devil is active in our lives, seeking to do great harm. Last week, we had the same sermon summary and theme as we have this week. It's the continuation, right? Satan wants to destroy you, and he works at it, and he's actually good at it. He's been doing this for 2,000 years. Satan wants to destroy you, but Christ promises to deliver you. This is what we see. Now, before we even get into the, the, this Vision, again, because we're talking here about this great dragon. We're talking about the devil. So let me give you the, the, the big picture on, of the vision on the front end. Then we're going to talk about Satan a little bit. So in this vision that begins in verse 1 of chapter 12, we have these three characters, the woman and the dragon and the child, right? Highly symbolic vision where we have a woman who is pregnant, ready to give birth to a son, and the woman represents the people of God, right? It's, 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 it's Israel leading into the church. It's the people of God through which the Messiah would arrive, right? And then most specifically through Mary. So we've got the people of God. That's the woman. And the, and the woman is about to give birth to the child. Christ is going to arrive. And when Christ arrives, he will destroy the devil. Well, there's a dragon who knows that the Christ is coming. The Messiah is coming. The dragon is Satan. And he's like, I am going to destroy this child. I'm going to devour that child and get rid of him. And so even before Christ was born, the devil was seeking to destroy the child by virtue of destroying the, the lineage, the family tree. On and on, he tried to destroy the Jews, couldn't do it. Christ arrives, can't do it. Child is born, the devil is waiting, but he can't destroy the child. In fact, the child is then taken up, ascends into heaven. And then the devil begins to focus on the woman, the church. And the woman flees to the wilderness, and there she is protected and nourished by God. So that's what we've covered so far in the vision now, before we go any further, let me just take a minute to just briefly talk a bit about Satan. Now, there's a whole lot that I really want to communicate in this message that I simply cannot, not because I'm not allowed, not because uh, anybody would be upset, but because we don't have time. So I'm going to cover what I can. But let me just say this. Satan is a being that was created by God for his glory, and when he was created, he was good. He was righteous. He was beautiful. He was amazing. Satan, or Lucifer, back before he was brilliant he was good just like all of God's creation you remember the beginning of Genesis God made all things and all things were good right because God made them but something happened something happened in the mind in the heart of this being this angelic being Satan and he fell now there are a couple of passages in the Old Testament that biblical scholars and theologians throughout the centuries have said this not only points to a worldly ruler who was corrupt and fell but it also because of its extreme language is clearly telling us what happened with the devil who is the ruler of this world right so let me give you a, a couple of examples one is in Ezekiel chapter 28 beginning in verse 12 listen you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways. From the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub. 
from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. We have this, this dramatic picture of this angelic being who filled with pride, rebelled against God to make much of himself. He rebelled, he fell, and is cast out. Read this also in Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah 14, starting verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. The devil was God's angel created for God's glory to do good things but he rebelled and has been cast out now when did all this happen it happened between Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 and we don't really have any more information than that that would have been the time frame in which he made it and when this happened because in Genesis 2 all things are good that God made in Genesis 3 there comes Satan tempting Eve And after he is cast out of his place of honor and privilege, he continues in his rebellion with the angels that he had amassed to go with him. And what is he doing? He is tempting God's people, attacking, deceiving the world. And yet, throughout this time, he would appear before God. If you read the Old Testament, you see he does this a few times. There's a couple of accounts where he walks into the throne room, like he shows up and he wants to talk to God about some of God's people and what he wants to think of the book of Job. He wants to talk about how Job is a poser. He's a, he, he's a player. He, he's not, he doesn't really love you. He's accusing Job of being a phony. And he says, listen, the only reason he even loves you and follows you is because you give him all the good stuff. Look at his wife, look, look at his kids, look at his money, look at his farms, look at his possessions. If you let me take it away, he's going to curse you. So he is in the throne room of God accusing Job of being a fake. And this is what Satan continued to do even after being removed from his position of power and authority. He sought to destroy Jesus. As we said, we saw this last week, he sought to destroy the Christ before his arrival and upon his his arrival. And now he's coming after the church. And so this is where we are in the vision. Now, in the first few verses, verses 7 through 9 here, the first part of this, we see that there is a war in heaven, and this war in heaven is a picture of what was happening in the heavenly realms while Christ's ministry was being accomplished on earth. So what we're about to read is what was happening while Jesus was healing the sick, preaching the gospel, feeding the masses. While he was doing all of this, this is what was happening in the heavenly realms. Now a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. This is the war that was taking place in heaven while Christ was accomplishing his earthly ministry, preaching, teaching, and healing, casting out demons. Throughout Christ's ministry, Satan was being overthrown. He's the ruler of this world, right? That's what Scripture says again and again. And yet, his power was diminishing. His reign was weakening. And we see this at a number of places. For example, in Matthew 12, specifically verses 28 and 29. But in Matthew 12... Jesus is casting out demons. His disciples are casting out demons. And the Pharisees are like, you're casting out those demons by, by, by the power of Satan. Stop that. And Jesus says, well, first of all, that doesn't make any sense. If I was doing that, then Satan would be beating Satan. So you should be happy. 
okay? Um, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm actually doing this by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if I'm doing this by the power of the Spirit, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then he says this. He says, besides, you can't just walk into a strong man's house and take his stuff. You've got to get in there, and you've got to wrap him up. You've got to bind him. You've got to throw him to the side. Then you can plunder his goods. And Jesus, the implication here is that Jesus says, listen, I've come into the strong man's house, the ruler of this age. I've come into this kingdom that he has built, and I am taking it. I've bound him, and now I'm taking it. I'm taking captive a host of captives. I'm redeeming, I'm saving, I'm rescuing. Bound the strong man. After he sends out all of his disciples to preach and to cast out demons, they come back and they're like, I can't believe it's working. This is amazing. And then Jesus says, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. In the vision, Satan is being cast down, down to the earth, no longer having access to those heavenly places. You see, he was appearing in the throne room, appearing before God to accuse God's people of being fake. But he's been cast out. Christ's ministry has crippled Satan's work. He can only exist in this worldly, earthly plane because Jesus has ascended. Jesus sits enthroned. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. He sits on his throne in session, ruling, reigning. Satan ain't getting in. So he's down. He's down here. Now this war mentions Michael, right? Michael, the archangel, and his angels fighting against the devil and his. While Christ was doing this, there was this battle. If you don't know who Michael is, uh, do a little Bible study, do a little research, use the Bible dictionary, Bible encyclopedia, but Michael, archangel, protector of Israel, right? So it's different angels have different purposes and functions. So here we have Michael, the archangel, guardian of Israel, guardian of God's people, leading an army of angels against Satan and his. And so we see what's, hap- what's being described here has been the whole theme of the book. The theme of the book is the victory of Christ and the church over the devil and the world. Satan has been cast down. He doesn't appear before God to accuse us. If he wants to accuse us, he's got to do it up close and personal to us individually. And he does. He is the great dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil, the Satan, right? We see, we see all of these words, and again, to call him the great dragon demonstrates that he is powerful. Yes, he has lost. Yes, he's been beaten, but he's still active, and he's still dangerous. He is not omnipotent. He is not omniscient. He can't read your mind, but he can know how you think. He is dangerous, though he's not divine, He's called the ancient serpent because, yes, this is the one who's been with us from the very beginning in Genesis, tempting Eve. He is the devil, Satan, the deceiver, the accuser. And here, Satan remains active in his work. So there's this war in heaven that relegates Satan to the world, no longer having access to the heavenly realm. And then there's this announcement in heaven in verses 10 through 12, right, which sounds a lot like a song, and a lot of scholars believe that this is a song. Listen, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So here is this song of praise. Jesus has accomplished salvation in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, in all of his teaching, in all of his obedience to the Father's will. In his casting out of demons, in his death on the cross where he took our place and died for our sins, in his resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven. In all of that, Jesus has accomplished for us forgiveness and reconciliation to God. And therefore, he has delivered us from the rule or the reign of Satan. Our enemy has been defeated. Though he is defeated, he is still active. In fact, that he knows he is defeated amps him up to be even perhaps more active, more frantic. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in this part of the vision, we see that salvation has been announced and accomplished. Therefore, we are conquerors, more than conquerors even, 
right? Our confidence is in the death or the blood of Jesus Christ. They conquered him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So there's two things here to keep in mind. Our confidence in the world against the devil is not in us, but in Christ. We know that he is ruined because he was conquered by the Son of God actually being murdered. Because all of it was a part of the plan by which Christ would disarm the, the, the power that these spiritually, these demonic spiritual entities had. They've lost their power, they've lost their authority because Christ has made full atonement. Our confidence is in Christ's blood because what do we see in Christ's blood? We see the love of God, right? God's love is demonstrated in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and there's nothing that can separate us from God's love, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation. So our confidence is in Christ's blood and what do we now have by which we continue to overcome the devil? The word of our testimony. We overcome by the word of our testimony. Now, that's not overcoming the devil with our words, but with God's word, with God's gospel. It is a declaration or an announcement or a heralding of all that has been accomplished in and through Jesus Christ. That's our boast. That's our message. That's what I needed somebody to tell me when I was lost and asking questions. This is the only message that we have that changes lives, that rescues people out of hell, out of the grip of Satan, out of despair, it's the only message that we have that is a paradigm-shattering truth that will transform someone's life and renew their soul. The gospel is our boast, the word of our testimony. And this gives us confidence unto the end, even unto death. And so in this part of the passage, we see heaven rejoicing and earth readying. Right, so heaven rejoices, it says, because, hey, rejoice, because the devil's gone, party time, but for you on the earth, this is bad, because now all of his attention is on you. All of his attention is there. He's focused. He's hyper-focused. He's hyper-vigilant because he knows his time is short. Look again at verse 12. Always takes me a minute to find it. Here we go. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and all you who dwell in them. But woe to you on earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is short. He knows the end game. I don't know how much he believes it, but he knows it. And so he is amped and ready. He is hard at work doing what the devil does, which is opposing the church in such a way to seek to destroy us, to ruin us, and to continue to deceive the world from believing in Christ. And we see this in this last section here, verses 13 through 17. Look with me here. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness. It sounds like Lord of the Rings. It's crazy, right? Because it's, it's vision. It's apocalyptic. It's not fantasy. Fantasy is based on visionary and apocalyptic literature oftentimes in its, in its depiction of the story. But this is a vision of what is real. So to say that it is a vision and apocalyptic is not the same thing as saying that it is fantasy. The woman, the church, is given wings by which we don't just flee but fly away to safety. In other words, we are divinely enabled and protected to not only flee from the devil's attacks but to be strengthened in the midst of them, to be nourished and preserved through them. And where do we go? We go to the wilderness the, the, the church is depicted as growing wings and flying to the wilderness where, what? Where the people of God are tested and proven. Where Israel was tested. Where Jesus in Luke 4 was tested and tempted and persevered. This is what we have. The church fleeing from the devil in order to be protected. The serpent poured water like a river out of its mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. 
So the, the serpent now is looking to swallow up the church, to devour the church. Excuse that. The woman is looking to um, hide herself and be protected. The devil spews forth this water, and it's a flood meant to envelop or to bury, to consume the church. But what happens is the attack of the devil, the flood, is actually swallowed up by the earth. The earth winds up protecting the church. Now, not the earth is a philosophical system, right? But in God's providence, there is no way that the dragon can concede, can, can uh, be victorious uh, over the woman. The earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured forth from its mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So for the sake of time, I want us to keep the big picture here. The church resists the devil, flees from the devil, finds safety, protection, and nourishment in God through Jesus Christ. This is what we have. And yet, that just means that Satan is coming for us. He is gunning for you. And one of the big mistakes that we make is to think like, well, as a Christian, I don't have to worry about it, or the devil's not involved, or you know what? I went through some kind of deliverance ministry in the 90s, so I'm totally clean. The devil can't touch me now. Whatever nonsense we believe to kind of comfort ourselves from thinking that we're not living in some kind of a horror movie, when in reality we are. The devil is real and he wants to ruin you. He has a plan and a strategy. He's good at this. He doesn't have a one-size-fits-all approach. He only does so many things, but he does them in a million different ways for millions of different people. So let me just tell you three things that Satan does. There's much more that could be said, much more that needs to be said. We don't have time. I'm just going to give you three. Three things that Satan does. Number one, he lies. He lies, he de deceives, right? We see this right away in the beginning, in the garden. He lies to Eve, right? He's, he's twisting what God had said. Did God really say you can't eat from any of these trees? And Eve's like, no, of course no. He said we can't eat from the one tree, the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can't eat of that one. The rest are fine. He's like, really? The reason God doesn't want you to eat that is because he doesn't want you to become like him. That's why. So the devil starts poisoning Eve's mind, lying to her, deceiving her. And this is what the devil does. He's very good at it. Listen to John chapter 8, starting in verse 39. They answered Jesus, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works of, that your father did. And they said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is, not because, it is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. The devil is the father of lies, and he lies, right, in order to deceive. He lies in order to lead us away from the truth, and he does this in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes he is lying to people in the world to blind them from the truth of the gospel. Right? He is trying to keep them away from hearing the good news, to keep them rooted in a belief system or in a faith system that makes the gospel wholly unappealing. So there's false religion lies. There are also lies that the devil uses uh, to uh, lead Christians into a corrupt kind of theology. The devil doesn't have to come at like the big doctrines 
to get into our lives and to wreak havoc. He just needs to get in. He can find one point of entry, one small doctrine, and he begins to twist. He begins to turn. He begins to lie. And that is one of the ways in which the devil begins to move us. It's all designed to lead us. It's all designed... See, deception ultimately leads to a kind of, if not distortion, destruction. You know what else? Listen, some of the lies that the devil gets us to believe don't even have anything to do with the Bible. Some of the lies that the church is really distracted by are just plain old conspiracy theories. Now, there's like one in a thousand conspiracy theories that turn out to be like, oh, that's totally true. That's like not just a theory. That's been shown to be true. But most of the conspiracy theories, make no mistake about it, when the church is grabbing hold of them, it is a tool, an instrument used by the devil to get us off of the point, the mission of the church, the glory of God, the gospel that we're supposed to be preaching. His lies deceive, distract, distort, and then ultimately destroy. If he's not lying, he's tempting, right? It's another thing the devil does. The devil tempts. Again, we see it in the garden, but it's been happening all along. Christ was tempted in the wilderness when he was at his weakest, Some of you all think like, oh, big deal. Jesus was hungry and the devil tempted him to have bread and Jesus was like, no, I'm good. Like, that's not what it was. You do know that, right? Jesus was fasting. His body was at the end of its run. Like, he was fading and the devil comes in to tempt him at his weakest moment. You know what that's like. The difference between you and Jesus is that Jesus persevered and you cave. I cave. The devil tempts us, which means he lures us by appealing to our weaknesses and our interests and our sin, just like those lies, distract us and then destroy us. Listen, if the devil wants to destroy you, uh, he doesn't have to say like, hey, here's a, here's a big pile of cocaine. Have fun. Because most of y'all, most of y'all would be like, not interested, don't want a pile of cocaine. Or, hey, here's a way to destroy your marriage. Or, here is, here is an addiction that's going to wreck your life. Most of us would be like, why would I want to do that? You're not one decision away from ruining your life. You're maybe you're three decisions away, five decisions away from blowing everything up. And the devil knows that because he's smarter than you. So he'll start with a small thing. He'll move you incrementally. He will tempt you and see you give in and you'll go closer and closer and closer to the edge until you are hungry to jump off. The devil lies. He tempts. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. Here's how real the temptation problem is. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. Here's what Paul says to his brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. For fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. He's like, I had to find out about you because I became afraid that you were being tempted and led astray by the devil. I was nervous that I was going to find out that you guys had completely collapsed. He lies, he tempts, and you know what else he does? He accuses. He does more than this, but these are three big ones. He accuses. Now, he doesn't go into the throne room and and accuse us before God, but now he whispers in our ears. He accuses us. And I swear, I swear, I know what it's like for the devil to be involved in my life as a non-Christian. He is terrifyingly real as a Christian and where I have felt it the most is in the realm of accusation where the devil seems to be whispering like you are such a fake you barely believe in fact you don't even really believe the faith that you have is just a a convenient affirmation of doctrinal truths you don't have faith or affection for God you don't really believe if you did you wouldn't be doing the things that you do you'd make more progress you'd bear more fruit The devil's constantly whispering in our ears in different ways, accusing us of either being failures or being nobodies or or being fake, of of being people who are not going to make it, who are definitely, certainly going to give in to our worst impulses. The devil likes to accuse us 
He's still, he's still coming for me. And this, this is where I tend to see it, right? When the devil accuses you, he's getting you to focus on yourself. He wants you to see yourself. And, and the reason he's good at this is because oftentimes he's just showing you who you are. He doesn't have to trick you. No offense, you are kind of losers, right? We're all kind of losers. We, we sin, we fail, we mess up, we're broken, we're backwards. We, 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 we do the wrong thing. You're supposed to love this person and you're supposed to serve this person. And what do you do? You say mean things, you hurt their feelings. We're supposed to put God and others first and we put ourselves first. The devil just holds up a mirror to us, but then he talks to us about that reflection. And he goes, you see, look at yourself, focus on yourself. Look, what do you see there? Failure, unworthiness. And he's not wrong. We're unworthy. And we're failures. You see, you focus on yourself, and it's easy, it's easy to find your way back into despair. This is why Robert Murray McChain said, for every look you take at yourself, take 10 looks to Christ. And you see yourself for what you are in your brokenness, weakness. Focus more on Christ because he's your hope, he's your salvation, he's your redemption. And when the devil comes to you and starts to say, look at you, why would God love you? You're a mess, you're broken. Why would God choose you? Why would God use you? You are pathetic. Instead of arguing with the devil, agree with him. You're absolutely right. Here's what Martin Luther said. When the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him, I admit, I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. And where he is, there I shall be also. You're absolutely right. I'm unworthy, unlovely. I am spiritually ugly in myself, but God loves me anyways. You see, that's... That's the beauty. You get off of yourself and look on to the Lord, and there you see what? Unrelenting, unending, eternal love and affection that cannot be broken by any strategy of the devil or any failure on your part. See, Satan wants you to either love yourself so much that you deify yourself, or he wants you to hate yourself so much that you destroy yourself. He wants you to forget about Christ and see only yourself. That's what Satan wants to do. Satan wants to destroy you. He is real, people. But while you should not ignore him, you don't have to be afraid of him because Christ promises to deliver you. But the promise of deliverance means a guarantee of affliction, doesn't it? To promise I'm going to deliver you means, okay, you're going to need delivering. You're going to be attacked, you're going to be hurt, you're going to be bloody, you're going to be weary, but I will bring you through it. One last passage, we'll close with this, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse, we'll do, let's do uh, 14. Since therefore the children, that's us, people of God. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, we are all humans, human race, one race, we're all the same. Jesus himself likewise partook of the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all of those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham, that's us. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You will be tempted. You will be tested. You will be lied to by the devil. You will face accusation. And at every point along the way when the, when the fight is real and you're called to resist the devil, you don't do it on your own. You have the assurance that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You have the assurance that Christ has suffered all these temptations himself and is victorious over them. And in his victory, he now helps you. We don't need to be hyper-focused on Satan. We don't need to find a demon behind you know, every TV show and every news story. Uh, 
But we do need to be aware that the devil has a strategy of spiritual attack that does cause great harm to many believers. What we need to do is to be so rooted and grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ that the word of our testimony, our song, our message is with us at all times. First for ourselves so that we don't forget and then for the world that they might be saved. Because without that message, they have nothing but the oppression of the devil. But in Christ, we are more than conquerors and we are ambassadors who have been gifted the opportunity to speak on behalf of our Lord as we proclaim his life and his death and his resurrection for all other unworthy sinners. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you would help us to see how much help you have given us in Christ. Lord, that we, would, that we would not forget it or take it for granted, Lord, that we would take advantage of all of these things, Lord, that we would cherish them, that we would love your word, delight in it, read it, that we would pray for one another and encourage one another, that we wouldn't attempt to, to engage in these spiritual fights on our own, but to be honest with each other, for mutual edification and help. Lord, help us to see that this is a real spiritual problem that can cause real spiritual damage if we're not ready for the fight. So Lord, help us to see the devil for who he, for who he is and, and what he is and what he does. But help us to remain confident in Christ who is our king, who is Lord over all. Amen. Let's all stand together. Hebrews 1 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be a son to me. And again, he brings the firstborn into the world. He says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels wind and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. For you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet?
And now may the God of peace, who will soon crush Satan under your feet, strengthen you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Amen.